G'day and welcome to It's Always Sunny in Brisbane. This is Patrick speaking, but I'm not the only bloke here. I got a uh, two fellas with me. Please introduce yourselves. Well, I would, well, 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 uh, my got them, uh, somebody about, um, uh, yeah, the boom, how are you? I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Oi, Crocodile Dundee, uh, you call that a podcast? I'll show you a podcast. Uh, and uh, good day, mates. It's Lugia. You know, you, you didn't introduce yourself. Red. Me? Yeah. Oh. You, you never said your drama. name, you dimwit. You just spoke gibberish. I'm red drama to you. Welcome to Max Mofo Pokemon. Okay. Nah, it's always sunny in Brisbane. And we're, we're, we're just a couple of larrikins, we are. Anyway, um, a lot of people died this week. I don't know how a better way to transition. There, there so, was uh, just no segue for that. First death was um, Robert Hansen. Uh, Robert Hansen um, was an American FBI agent um, who turned out to be a spy for the Soviet and Russian um, intelligence service against the United States, you know, during the Cold War. And um, had an interesting story where uh, when the FBI got tipped off that there was a mole, he was the one that was put in charge of, like, finding the mole. So obviously, you know, it's kind of like a, de- a departed situation. And then... um. Yeah, eventually the CIA, they, they were able to find uh, their own mole, and that mole basically gave out Robert Hansen. It was like interesting kind of story. Anyway, he, he passed away, age 79. Uh, he died in prison. Uh, who, you know who else died in prison? The Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski, passed away, um, 81. Are you guys familiar with the Unabomber? Uh, uh, somewhat. I think I've heard the name... And know that he made a cameo in one of the Dragon Ball games on GBA. Yeah, uh, Legacy of Goku 1. Yeah. So the Unabomber was, um, he was just like a math professor or something that kind of became like a hermit and lived in the woods and was against anti-technology. And then he started a mail bombing campaign because uh, he thought the Industrial Revolution really fucked shit up. I was trying to bring America back to the Dark Ages. Yeah, he kind of failed. He had this manifesto that um people find interesting nowadays because he was uh, a smart person, even though he was nuts. So, you know, he's an interesting political figure, I guess. Um, For less messed up news, we got a couple entertainers. Um, Ian McGinty, who is this uh, animator, was probably best known for his work in Adventure Time, Being Cut Puppy Cat, and uh, Invader Zim. He unfortunately uh, passed away, age 38. He also had his own uh, creator own comic series, so it was a uh, Real unfortunate. Um, heart goes out to his family. Uh, yeah. So always a shame when a talented guy dies it's young. Shame too. I really like Adventure um, Time and Invader Zim. Yeah. Uh, and the Iron Sheik also passed away. Who was a uh, well-known wrestler back in the day. He was a big. He was a uh, one of Hulk Hogan's uh, kind of competitors. He was kind of like the counterpart to Hulk Hogan. So he was a uh, one of the big wrestlers of the '80s. So rest in peace, the Iron Sheik. Uh, he also passed away at '81. And uh, the last guy is uh, Pat Robertson. Okay, yeah. so Pat Robertson was, he was a few things. He was a media mogul. He was a religious broadcaster. He was a political commentator. He was a minister at one point. He died at 93. And, okay, the, here's, let me, to give you an idea of the type of person he was, he blamed September 11th on the gays. And he said that Hurricane Katrina was caused by abortion. Uh, what? I, 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 swear to you, I, su- I swear to you, I'm not making this up. Source? This is remind, this is remind it was, me it of was a... Some, it was some article. There's a whole Wikipedia page of controversies with Pat Robertson. This reminds me of when I told you guys about that movie, I said, Buck Breaking, I told you every insane conspiracy that was in that flick. And this guy tried to run for president, by the way. Back in 1988. What the fuck? I don't know, but like I, I first heard out oh, Pat Robertson died. That's a shame. Looking into it. Okay, fuck this guy. <laughs> the complete 180. Like like I swear to you, I am not making this stuff up. He actually said that. <laughs> okay. I guess I I don't have anything to add to that. I don't even know how you can segue from that. I don't either. Um I do have one more thing. Gamers? So this- <laughs> This yeah. is all right. Yeah, let's let's switch to something more lighthearted. It's just that was so unbelievable. I just had to say it. Yeah. But so anyway. while you, uh, yeah, video games, and movies. So, so question. Um, 
Have you guys heard about the new Sonic game? Yes, Sonic Superstars. Yeah. Yes. Thoughts? Oh, yeah, duh. Yeah, I guess we should have. Um, I think it's interesting. I kind of feel like the lighting engine is like kind of weird. Like visually, I'm not... I'm kind of mixed on it, but um, I like how they've successfully kind of re replicated the classic Genesis physics in 3D. Um, and we'll just have to see the level design, because the level design is kind of the most important part, so... They're not yeah, bringing back any other stages from previous games, so I guess that's a plus, so we don't get to see Green Hill or Chemical Plant or any, any other stage that's been reused to the ground for the past 20 years. There's yeah, one stage um, they showed in the trailer... Playable? There's one stage yeah, they showed in the trailer, it kind of reminded me of something from Sonic Advance 2, I don't remember the level name though. In the gameplay footage, it's the level where they change into jellyfish. Oh yeah, yeah. It reminds me of that weird, um, like, yeah, that I don't know, it was a weird, it was a real, it was, I don't remember the names of the levels from Sonic Advance 2, but it's the one that was I think it was very, Techno like, Base Zone? Probably. The one that, like, flashes purple every now and then? Yeah, that's the one. I don't know, that's what it reminded me of. But what, what I find compelling, or very interesting, about Sonic Superstars is they want four-player multiplayer and how do you do that in a 2D Sonic game? Well, they did it with the classic games, but, well, yeah, but the that camera was only focuses players. on Sonic. That was two I players. Think... You have four characters all running super fast on screen. It's not like Mar like New Super Mario Brothers, where, you know, it's slower pace. They're going to try making it like New Super Mario Brothers. I've, I've seen yeah. the comparisons. and Yeah, I thought of that too, but I'm just curious. How are you going to make four-player work in, a, in like a, a 2D Sonic game? That's what I'm concerned about or curious about. Yeah. I'm like cautiously optimistic. It's just like I think it looks a little visually weird with the lighting. And apparently, the lead developer producer on it is one of the guys who produced um his previous work was Balan Wonderworld, Yoshi's New Island, and Hey Pikmin. And I'm like, oh no, oh no, that's a terrible resume. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, yeah, like, we'll see. yeah, uh. The engine is clearly good, so even if, like, I guess the level design is weak, I guess you'll get, like, Sonic fans could probably make some fun mods. But, yeah. It'll be interesting. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. I have my doubts, but I, uh, I don't know. It looks like it could be fun. I am going in with very, very low expectations because the first few seconds I saw of that game, my mind immediately went to Sonic 4, and that is not a good thing. Thankfully, it doesn't it's seem like the, the graphics that's throwing me off. Like, yeah, the, the physics yeah. is actually the main reason Sonic Four was bad. But this looks like it got the physics right. So, like now, I'm just like. So at the very it, least, it just, I'm just it has, like, hoping a weird visual style to me. Yeah, I'm just hoping that it's going to be a fun single player experience. But we'll yeah. we'll have to see when the game comes out. I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, Again, it's the yeah. multiplayer. I'm curious about. I'm a little annoyed, though, how, like, you know, the Sonic Mania team kind of got, got fucked over, you know, Sonic Mania 2 got canceled, and they, you know, make this, it's like, eh. There wasn't a Sonic Mania 2, at least if there was, it was It was in production, actually, but it got, uh, it got canned, um, ultimately, and, uh, Sega was so that, mad that fans were better happened. at making games than they were. Yeah, I should probably play Frontiers one of these days, too. It's, it's good, but don't expect anything grand out of it. Are we head down, Enda? I guess so. The Adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. This was directed by Stephen, Stephen Elliott. Is it, which one is it? Stephen? I think Stephen. Stephen Elliott. Even yeah, with Stephen. Uh, the PH, there's, there's, it's Stephen. There's, there's, no, no, there's, there's there, Stephen. The, a is what, the A is what's throwing me off. Stephen Elliott. I mean, okay, well, he's Australian, so it's like, hey, my name is Stephen. Yeah, it's probably Stephen. My name is Stephen. Stephen, Stephen Elliott. The Adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, was directed by Stefan Elliott, who directed movies I don't recognize. Frauds, Welcome to Wop Wop, Easy Virtue, and A Few Best Men. Does that sound familiar to you guys? A Few Best Men? A Few Best Men. That doesn't sound like another movie I've heard of before, no. <laughs> I mean, have, going, just going off of these movies, do these sound familiar? No. I mean, just going yeah, off of the title. Tomography. Yeah, I don't recognize any of his movies. Mm -hmm. Well, that, this is probably his most famous one, so... Anyway, just a few fun facts about the production is that there were a lot of people considered for this movie, for the three leads. Uh, Tim Curry, 
Tony Curtis, John Cleese, Rupert Everett, Jason Donovan, and Colin Firth were all considered for Anthony, Adam, and Bernadette. But in the end, we got Hugo Weaving, Guy Pearce, and Terrence Stamp. Just, just imagine an al- alternate universes with these people instead. I wonder if this is like one of like this has to be one of Hugo Weaving's like first real big roles, right? Probably, yeah. Was, uh, Probably. Yeah. This was before the Matrix. This is before the Matrix. Uh, like I think his his biggest role like after this was like before this was probably like one he voiced like one of the animals in Babe. Actually, no, that was after this movie. So even the Babe was after this. So yeah, I think this might have been one of his like early leading roles. And in case you're wondering why the three and the guy main... Pierce, guy Pierce wasn't big till after this. In case you're wondering why the three leads are portrayed by straight men, the answer is that, well, according to Hugo Weaving, Stephen Elliott did reach out to several gay actors to audition for the film, but at the time, none of them wanted to be portraying those types of roles. I guess they didn't want to be typecasted. So yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Also, I'm like, if we're being technical, Hugo Weaving's character is like kind of straight. Ish. It's, I'd say he's bi. Yeah, because like it sounds more accurate. Although he is in a hetero mm-hmm. relationship. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's in he's in two hetero relationships. So the movie released in 1994, and while it did garner a bit of controversy, it was positively received, and it made two twenty nine point seven million against a budget of two million U.S. dollars. And it actually won the Oscar for best costumes that year. Which fun fact. Uh, Many of the outfits in this movie were made for very cheap, just out of like cheap items you could find at like Walmart and Target. Like the flip flop dress, for example, that was made for seven dollars. <laughs> well, you're definitely making lemons out of lemonade. Uh, the other mm-hmm. way around. Fuck. <laughs> I can't even make the comparison. Lemons. Right? <laughs> okay. And apparently, um, Lizzie Gardner, one of the one of the costume designers, she designed a dress made out of American Express cards. That was supposed to be used in the film, but American Express said no. So Aww. she instead so she instead wore it to the Oscars and accepted her award in that dress. That's funny. That is funny. And like they were genuine American Express cards. They were all just expired. Anyway, to this day, uh Priscilla Adventure Adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, has remained a popular film in the LGBTQ plus community. And in 2006, it was adapted into a stage musical, which premiered in Sydney that year and opened on Broadway in 2011. This would usually be the part where I would comment on the musical, but I have not seen it, nor have I listened to it, so I can't give any sense. Though that did win Best Costume at the Tonys that year, so I guess rule of thumb, if you're, if you're doing a production of Priscilla, you gotta nail the costumes, whether it be you know, on film or on stage. A budget of $2 million and grossed about $3 million, so big success. Yeah, good for mm-hmm. them. Indeed. Yeah. Um, one fun fact I wanted to mention is um, apparently the director of the film, uh, so he is gay, but it's funny is that he didn't come out until uh, 15 years like later in, um, not 15, like 17 years later in uh, 2012 is when he came out. So I'm like, wow. Director of the gayest movie I've ever seen was in the closet. It was like, man, he did not do a good job of like flying under the radar. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> like, okay. Well, anything else you want to talk about? Um, we'll get into the plot. I guess it's kind of worth mentioning, unless you count the musical adaptation of Groundhog Day. I think this is the first time we're discussing a production from Australia. Uh, I guess. Possibly. Did we? We haven't talked about any uh, George Miller movies, right? No. Yeah. Okay, I guess this is the first Aussie film. Achievement unlocked. Yeah. We had an oh. Irish film earlier with Seven Psychopaths, so yeah, cool, cool, cool. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Uh, enough beating around the bush. What is Priscilla about? Well, it is about two drag queens and a trans woman traveling across the Australian outback in a bus, the titular Priscilla, as they make their way to perform at a hotel far out from Sydney. And the hotel is actually uh, owned or run by the wife of Hugo Weaving's character. Anthony is his name, or Tick, either one. Yeah, uh, was, uh, and, mm-hmm. and yeah, that's, that's basic, it's, basic, it's basically a road trip vibe movie where it's yeah. more about the um, scenarios they get into and the characters they come across. Yeah. 
two five so trip movies in a you, row. You guys, oh yeah, here's a funny thing. Um, most LGBT movies are vibe movies or road trip movies. Um, so when I was actually coming with my recommendation for this week, I was just like going through a list of nothing but vibe and road trip movies. It's like, God damn it, we've done so many of these already. <laughs> it's like, oh well. Mm. Yeah, I was like, bite the bullet. I was like, fuck, fuck it, let's just do another one. Who cares? Right, yeah. Fine. Um, in a row. Yeah. Oh, uh, what, what yeah. do we think? Actually, Luke, yeah, I want you to start. I thought Red had something he wanted to say. No, no. Go All ahead. Right. Uh, okay. Um, I like this. It wasn't like anything spectacular. It was just a fun, like, sit down and watch sort of movie. Just seeing these three characters, uh, not really get to know each other, but like try to work together to make it to the hotel and some things go wrong. It's just, I guess it's a nice comfy movie, kind of. I think the word to describe it is pleasant. Yeah. It's a very sweet movie. You know, I think what elevates it is the three main characters, particularly the performances. I mean, Hugo Weaving, Guy Pearce, and Terrence Stamp, they are just superb. I particularly thought that um, Guy Pearce was a real show stealer. Absolutely. Like yeah. Biggest like, personality, I was like, wow. No wonder, like, he would become, like... Guy Pierce and Hugo Wiegand, even in particular, like, they... Like, I find it interesting that they're the ones that, like, really stood out, because, like, I guess... Guy Pierce to me, has always played, like, very understated roles in, like, all the other movies I've seen him in, because, like, when I think of him, I think of, like, Memento, I think of L.A. Confidential, and he plays, like, very kind of, like... I don't know, kind of serious characters, when here he's just so over-the-top and fun. He's and, the like, most he's flamboyant person you can imagine here. Yeah, and Hugo Weaving, like, I know him for, like... Lord of the Rings and uh, The Matrix. He plays like comic book villain, so it's like interesting seeing him playing this like interesting character because I feel like Hugo Weaving is kind of like the real driving force of the plot. Like I'd say like Hugo Weaving is the driver of the plot. Karen Staff feels like the real heart and emotional core of it, and Guy Pierce is like it's like the comic relief. The comic, comic relief. relief. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Because I mean, Terrence uh, Stamp Hugo was Weaving... really impressive. Hugo Weaving and Terrence Stamp, they're the ones who actually have stuff to overcome on the trip. And Guy Pierce, he's just, I just, I just want to, like, climb up a mountain dressed in drag. It's been my childhood dream. I mean, I, I, do, I do think that one sequence where, like, he's getting hate crime was, like, very effective. Mm-hmm. I actually find, like, Terrence Stamp, like, such an interesting casting choice because, like, he's played, like, very, like, kind of strong, dominant male roles in the past. Like, he, um, he's General Zod. Like, he played General Zod in, like, the original Superman series. So it was, like, it's so interesting seeing, you know, a comic book villain, like, in a serious, like, fasci- almost fascist, like, comic book villain play uh, a trans woman. It was, like, oh, interesting. Don't forget a about Bob. Bob. A hunter. Bob. Yeah, Bob. Like Bob's, Bob's a bro. Okay. Bob and his wife were, like, the most insane additions to the story. Because, like, the, the egg scene, man... What the ping pong. It, it was ping pongs. <laughs> it was ping pongs. I, I can't. I can't remember. I just remember seeing something white, and like they're implying that she's doing some shit with her ass. I'm like, okay. I'll never look at a ping pong match the same way again. <laughs> yeah, and I was like vaguely racist. I'm like, man, the '90s used to be such a different time. Like, it's I. Okay, so um. I think when I said that this movie garnered some controversy, it's because of of Cynthia, Bob's wife. Like, like, sure, there was some. Controversy regarding, you know, LGBTQ themes because that's just the world we live in, unfortunately. But this was where the real controversy was. I've always been, like, fascinated, like, a lot of, like, the early history of, like, LGBT cinema because a lot of it was, like, very, like, they just embraced, like, the most edgy, crass, profane stuff ever because, um, you know, they're already isolated. Why should they, you know, care about decorum and whatnot? So I always found interesting how, like, most LGBT movies nowadays, they almost got, like, they, they almost feel sanitized or more prestige because, like, since queer issues are now being elevated, it's, it's, the people are more conscious of the image and, like, the, and they're trying to be important. And I feel like, I find it's interesting. I guess it's kind of stifling in some ways, but you also get to uh, reach out to a wider audience because, so, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting, I'd say. Um, the, probably the two most prominent queer filmmakers, uh, John Waters and Gregor Ackery, are particularly known for really pushing the envelope of what you can show in film like uh i think pink flamingos that's just known for like being really fucked up and i i know all the gregor Ack movies i've seen are really fucked up so yeah it's kind of how uh if we're, if we're on this wait is there more you wanted to say no i'm good 
right. I was gonna say, if we're on the subject of themes, I will say I do wish we got a bit more perspective in some areas. Like that scene where they're getting back on the bus and they see it's spray painted with like a very crude, brash uh, message brash, in red yeah. spray paint. Yeah. Yeah, they don't really go into that. Like they just they just cover it up, which I guess could be them suppressing it. Or maybe it's just that they're kind of used to the slander, so maybe. they don't really pay it much mind. I guess. Um, I, I thought the last act was particularly interesting, like story theme wise, because um, the whole relationship with his son uh, that was an interesting element, and um, I feel like they they spend enough time on it, but it's kind of like interesting how that's like to me some of the most emotionally interesting stuff, but it's kind of a Kind of a footnote, almost. Little, actually, that's another thing. I feel like maybe Anthony revealed he had a son or a wife a bit too early. Because it's like within the first 20 minutes, they, he has that scene where he confesses, yes, I've been married before. And they got like the really sad music playing. And he's like, I've held it, like, I've held it from you guys for so long. I'm finally coming out about it. I felt like that should have come later. I don't know. Just the way the scene was handled, it feels like this is like a third act. Or like middle part. I don't know. You guys I that? can see what you mean, but I think maybe without that, uh the the first and second act road trip wouldn't really stick with you as much since you still don't really know much about these characters. Fair enough. I think they needed something just to keep the the characters interesting. Yeah, no, I th- I thought that part was fine, even the I just think they maybe should have had like chewed on it a bit more. The relationship but, uh, between yeah, Bernadette and Bob was interesting because, like, I've never really seen oh, like a trans woman and like a straight heterosexual man might be falling in love. It was interesting. Yeah. Adam apparently carried someone's shit. Oh yeah, someone from ABBA. Yeah, I don't know what well, that, that was about. That, that was weird. You guys are gonna be in it if we ever get to Pink, pink Flamingo Flamingos. Is there anyway, um, in that movie as well. There is turd stuff. Oh yes, but not Abba. Is, okay, no Abba. Not Abba. All right. Let's see. Um, man, Australia really loves their uh, cars in the desert movies, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's another fun fact. Apparently, the the designer of the bus also designed the cars for Mad Max Fury Road. Forgot to mention that. Yeah, that that makes sense. Actually, yeah. Oh yeah, I think it's interesting that the turd is like that's a necklace that Guy Pierce's character like wears in some scenes. So I was like, okay. Interesting. Yeah. I, I thought it was just a fun movie. It's kind of a... It's not really, like, pretty... It's a pretty light movie. It's, like... Mm-hmm. I don't know. Probably something you, like, watch in, like, a... I don't know. If you're a college student listening to this, I'd recommend it. It's not really one of those movies where you really sit and analyze it. It's just a movie you sit down and you enjoy yourself. All right. You know, so as guess, as uh... far as that goes, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's pretty enjoyable. I'd, I'd still probably yeah. take something like uh, Everybody's Talking About Jamie over this. I still enjoyed it. I think I, I like this more. Like, I thought everybody like uh, talks about Jamie was like an okay film, but it, it wasn't like really to my taste. I feel like this one was more my speed. I think I'm with Patrick in terms of like how it handles its themes regarding the LGBTQ community, but this is just more so, like as we said before, a vibe movie, something that you just sit back, relax, and watch and don't really give it much thought. Yeah, I, I do think it's worth it for the performances alone. Like I said, these three leads are just terrific. Like I, I like the 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 tone, humor, and like characters of this more. With like Jamie, it's very hallmark. It's like it's almost like uh, too schmaltzy for like my taste, and I'm just not like a fan of that kind of like tone in general. So okay. uh, yeah, I just feel like this one it had like a grit to it, and but it was still like kind of light and fun. So yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was funny. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite moments is when Priscilla first breaks down. The first thing Anthony does is he rubs, like, face lotion on the gears. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know anything about cars. I'm just doing what I can. I remember liking the bar scene a lot where uh, Bernadette uh, yeah. was, like, having that drinking contest with the bar owner. She wasn't even phased. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um... I believe it's your turn now, Red. Yes. So... I was kind of uh, trying to decide what to do for this one because there are a lot of uh, LGBT movies. A lot of them are road trips. A lot of them are kind of adaptations of Shakespeare for some reason. But I figured uh, I was able to boil it down to kind of three. Um, so Lugia, yeah. I believe you mentioned you, you wanted to do John Waters. Like, 
at some point, right? John Waters? Uh, Pink Flamingos. What? He directed Pink Flamingos. I don't think so. Okay, never mind then. Because um, I wasn't going to do John Waters, but like I just... So, um, John Waters, Greg Araki, and uh, this early Japanese film called uh, Funeral Par- Parade of Roses. Those were like the three choices I got, and I think... I, I decided I'm, I'm going to go with Nowhere by Greg Araki for the film. Nowhere. It's apparently a bit of a vibe movie. I've heard it compared to, like, Days of Confused, but, like, on acid. So, uh, yeah. I haven't seen the movie, um, but knowing his work, it's probably going to, like, touch into some dark themes and subject matter, so just be prepared for that. Maybe look up a content warning uh, ahead of time. Actually, let me look up a content warning now. Nowhere in 1997. Smooth transition. transition. You know, going from a movie about characters yeah. in the middle of nowhere to a movie just called Nowhere. Yeah, Nowhere has content warning for graphic violence, sexual violence, and suicide. Yeah, it's a very dark movie, oh, though. No. Oh, okay. Yeah, fun. I didn't say it was fun. I just said it was important. This is uh, Greg Rocky is like one of the more significant. Listen, let me tell you the two Greg Rocky movies I've already seen. One of them was a stoner comedy, and the other one was about um, uh, the long-term effects of childhood sexual abuse. So, like, this, this man has a very bizarre range. You know, uh, pure, pure family content from this guy. Yeah, no, this is... Uh, listen, I don't know. This is, this is Pride Month. I don't know why you expected family content. On I know. I'm, I'm joking with you. Joking. Yeah, but, um, uh, yeah, just go in, maybe look up some stuff ahead of time, just so you guys aren't blindsided, but, uh, yeah. Just a quick disclaimer, Apparently, I don't think, yeah. given the rate that these episodes have been uploaded, I don't think that this is gonna be uploaded on Pride Month. That's we might fine. be doing these Pride Month episodes for July. That's fine. We'll the see. Important thing is, the important thing is we're watching them and talking about them in yeah. Pride Month. Yeah, besides, I just figured, like, I was eventually gonna get to a Greg Rocky thing and i figured nowhere is like arguably greg rocky's most like famous movie it's part of his trilogy it's part of the teenage apocalypse trilogy and it's probably like the it seems to be uh, the movie that his fans either consider his best or one of his weakest so i, I just think this would be the most interesting one to talk about um it's also been described as 90210 on acid which uh, sounds insane but yeah i've never seen 90210 so Neither have I. I don't, I don't know how to take that. I never even heard uh, of it before. It's Beverly Hills. It's some 90s MTV thing. It's some 90s MTV thing. I know it's almost Beverly Hills. I, that's it. Almost everyone I follow on Letterboxd has given it a 10 out of 10, so I'm expecting it to be uh, interesting because the people I follow on Letterboxd have some weird tastes, but we'll see. Anyway, uh, yeah. So Nowhere, 1997. From Greg Rocky, one of the important filmmakers of the new queer cinema movement and uh yeah he's a big director we're finally getting off for uh checklist you got a closer i don't know how to close this out so i'm just suggesting you guys want to go to hungry jacks uh d- sure mate all right uh oh no the bill is 900 dollars